Okay, what I wanted to go over now is today is analysis of variance. And analysis of variance it has to do with the process of deciding whether or not a line that you put through a data set is good enough. Um, and so uh, it starts with having a, a series of, or of observations, if you will. Okay, so you have a bunch of x uh, values, and at that there'll be uh, an experimental y value. If you want to think of this as a spreadsheet, you'll have maybe x1, but there's also these two points there. You can have you know, y that will also be the one experimental, and then the y2 uh, experimental as well. Uh, then they, these will go uh, forward, three, so on and so forth. And they may be replicates or not, but they're a series of actual observations. What you would do with this is, in a normal circumstance, is you would, of course, plot it. And that plot will give you an idea of what it is you're looking at. And in this particular case, we have our y values here and our x values uh, down here. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about, if you will, a straight line. And so let's say that you have more than one observation there, another one here, a couple more here, uh, and there. So these represent the, the different x values and then multiple uh, y values then corresponding to each one of those are the actual experimental observations. Okay, so the typical thing that, that most students are, are familiar with doing in this particular case would be using something like Excel where you could right click essentially on the data and with that you'll bring up a, a, a program called Trendline. It's actually a, a macro. And that trend line gives you the option of putting a straight uh, line through here, for example. And, um, and then you have you know, kind of this kind of thing. Um, and so now what trend line has done is, is, is fine for you uh, the, a, an equation that would be like y equals mx plus b. It's finding the straight line that will go through that data set. Um, and so what we had done the last time, or what we had done as part of the exercise, was to go through the process of fitting a straight line to the same data set, doing it in a different way where you actually then had a calculated value. This was calculated by essentially choosing a value of m and a, and a value of b. We call these guesses, if you will. And those guesses then allowed you to calculate y equals uh, m x plus b for each one of these values of x, okay? And then, so the, here you, you would call that calc, by the way. And then this would be y1 calculated and, and so forth. And then you went one step further and you then found the difference between the two squares. So this was the sum, the, the squared error. That would be the experimental value minus the calculated value. And squared it. And then these values then were added up to get you view the sum square error. And then what we did with solver was we took solver and we said guess at these values here. Okay and then use those to actually minimize the sum square error here. So you minimize, minimize this. And what you should have found in that analysis was is that you would get by this procedure, this M, he, and B would be exactly the same as what you would have gotten with trendline. Okay? And so it is the same basic process uh, for minimizing the sum square error and what the root problem does here, only that there is a precise mathematical way that you can find this by inversion of matrices and so forth that doesn't have to go through this process of actually guessing. It can get that number for you directly from the minimization of the sum square error. So, now, the other thing that I had mentioned last time was is that if, for example, you were then to do this so-called analysis of variance, A N O V A stands for analysis of variance, okay? Um, and you were to ask yourself, for instance, a very simple question, is this line statistically significant? The answer in virtually every case will be yes. And that's the, the, the reason why it's not that great a thing. And I said that if you were to, for instance, have this line here, okay? And ask yourself, is this statistically significant?
The answer to that would be always yes. Okay? Because what is being asked is not really, is this a good fit? All of you can see that this line is not very close to this data set here. It's asking, is this, this more than nothing? And of course, relatively is, is the thing, right? It's relatively, relative to this. And you can see that it describes maybe, I don't know, 30% of this. And so that value there is about 30%. And that is more than nothing. So the basic thing that you would get, for instance, if for some of you who, who actually know that when you do a trend line, you can ask it to give you, quote unquote, statistics. It gives you a big output in your Excel spreadsheet, but the answer to that is always exactly the same answer. The same word is yes, unless your model is so bad, okay? Here would be the example of the model that is not statistically significant. You don't need statistics to tell you that that's terrible. Okay? And so this entire analysis that you might do isn't telling you anything. The other thing that you're tempted to have is to do this so-called R squared thing, but it turns out that an R squared has a lot of problems with trying to know what it means. It doesn't distinguish between crappy data and a poor fit. And, if it doesn't dis and so a lot of people go, oh, I just want this to be close to one. Well, it's possible for it not to be close to one because your data is bad, not because the model is bad. And this does not tell you the difference. And so as a result of that, I say you may not use R squared. Okay? Uh, and in fact, ironically, not only is it an F in my class, but it turns out that the proper way to do this is done by what's referred to as an F test. Okay? So very much like what we've already shown as far as a T test, uh, or a chi-squared test, okay? There's a similar type of an, a statistical test that will tell you important questions. And the important questions come like this. This would be one question. One question would be right here. The question would be, does this go through zero or not? Okay, if it goes through zero, then it would be a different equation, right? It would be y equals mx. There is b is equal to zero. Okay. So you can ask that basic question of it, is it statistically significant or to allow this to not be zero? And you can ask that question using an actual uh, uh, analysis that I'll be showing you here. The second most important question that it will ask okay, is, the, is there curvature? So in here we have, is there curvature? In other words, it looks to me like maybe it's going like that, like a saturation enzyme kinetics. Maybe it starts through here and goes off like that. How do you know when the data is good enough that you can say that a straight line isn't good enough? I need to have a better equation. So you can ask yourself, uh, number one, should I change the model? And if I how do that, how should I do that in a way that will make a better uh, a, a, a statistically significant improvement on the fitting of the actual data itself. Now, the process of doing an analysis of variance is a little bit of a hybrid of what we had done with the, this procedure over here, which was the actual kind of minimization of some square error. Well, we'll be talking about the experimental values and their actual squares. And so uh, the table that I'm gonna to put together here now is referred to as an ANOVA table. It is very similar to the ANOVA table that is spit out by Excel, but it has more information in it if, you're, if you follow what I'm going through here. So this one is not the answer to what we'll be doing uh, in this class. Uh, in a way, an analysis of variance is a partitioning of error. And there are two major types of error that are here. One is, is that there's error because of crappy data. And the second is because there's a crappy model. And you can imagine there's different permutations of this. Because under some circumstances, you might have extremely crappy data and a really good model. Okay? Or you might end up having very good data and a crappy model, okay? 
And telling the difference between those is part of what you would use an analysis of variance for. Okay, so uh, it's actually pretty easy to do this mechanically if you keep track of this idea of partitioning where there is a total amount of squares. And what I mean by total, it turns out, is that the, you know, the sum of the squares here, the sum of squares, um, is literally taking each one of the experimental observations, each data point, and I just simply square that, and then I add them up. Okay? Now, there's a little bit of a leap of faith here, which you don't have to understand if you don't want to, but if you prefer to, is that you know that you're trying to get not from squares, but to error. And remember that error is the sum of the experimental minus the uh, calculated value. Okay. And then I square them up. And so you can see that if I was to expand this, I would end up with y experimental squared, and I would end up with y calculated squared, and there would of course be this term in the middle from the expansion of that. And it turns out that you can prove that when you minimize the sum square error, like we did there, that this goes to zero. It's a very long, long proof, okay? And it's in my, uh, my statistical training manual, and I do not want to bore you with it, uh, because it's hard enough sometimes to just understand the mechanics. But understand that this analysis of variance table is only valid if you have minimized the sum square error. And I'll get to that in a little more detail in a minute. So if there's a total amount of error, then it turns out that there's going to be a model error here. <coughs> the model then is going to be the sum of the y calculated squared. Okay? And so it's literally just simply taking your x values, putting them into your equation, like we did y equals mx plus b, and adding them up as well. In a spreadsheet, it's easy to imagine what that is. If we go back over to here, this would simply be taking these calculated values now and squaring them. Okay? I'm not going to take the difference because I know that from the mathematics that that is not longer necessary. I can actually get this information by the individual squaring of these two. So, there's the, the model, and then there's the residual, and the residual then is literally then the difference between these two. So you simply take that one minus that one, and that becomes the residual, and that's true in this, the table. Now, in order to do something with statistics, I have to know how crappy my data is, and I get my crappiness of the data just by looking at how variable it was here in the graph, okay? And so I have a situation here where and I might have a big error bar, and then I might have a small error bar here. I might have an even bigger error bar here, okay, and, and so forth. These are the actual measurements of true error. That is how bad your experimental data is, how crappy the data is. And so there's a term down here referred to as the true error, which you should think of as being the crappy data. Question mark. Might be good, might be bad. Now it turns out that we're going to be comparing the residual, in a sense, is how much I didn't fit with the model. This one here is how crappy my data is, and so there's going to be something here that will be the difference between these two. And what that is, is that's referred to as the left out terms. Okay? Um, what is a left out term? Well, we know that if we make our more and more adjustable parameters, when we take an equation, right? The more parameters that we have, a x, okay, to the b divided by c, you know, the more adjustable parameters that I have, the more I can fit anything. I can make my line do all kinds of things and go through my data set. Okay, so more adjustable parameters are the terms that I'm leaving out if I have a simple equation. So in this case, if it's y equals mx plus b, Okay, I could make this more complicated, but I've chosen not to, and that would be the, the, the um, additional so-called left out terms. Now, so now the real question then here is how do I get from squares to variance? Okay, because they're, they're actually different, and you have to normalize them to actually understand what's going on here. In other words, I want to look at how close my model is here, to these data points without worrying about all of this that was down here, 
Okay? And that's done by dealing with next what's referred to as the degrees of freedom. Degrees. And a lot of people have trouble remembering what degrees of freedom is. Um, and degrees of freedom are, well, nothing with my total degrees of freedom is just the number of data points. In this particular one here, you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It is literally how many columns of actual data do I have here. So that's the total degrees of freedom. When I take an average, like we talked about in statistics, I am adding a single number. That is y equals a constant, right? Well, that one constant, then that takes away one degree of freedom. So the model degree of freedoms is the number of adjustable parameters. In this particular case, it's y equals mx plus b. The adjustable parameters are m and b. And so it would be 2. It's not always 2, but it is the number of adjustable parameters that you have in the model itself. Okay? The residual is, well, just like it says. You subtract these two. That gives you the difference between the two. The only one then that's hard to figure out then is how many true error degrees of freedom there are. And it's very simply, it's the number of error bars. And so if I have another observation here where there's only one data point here and here, okay, then I can't count that as a measure of experimental error. I can only count the number of places in which I have an actual error bar. And so this is the number of error bars here. Oops. Which is the number of estimates of true error that I have. Because you have to have replication in order to actually get at the number of error bars there. And then the left out terms, well, this is in a sense, this is uh, it, um, the, like everything else, it's the residual minus the true. Okay? And so you fill in the rest of the table, table here as essentially resid, resid minus true, and that's also true in this one here. Now, the next part of this is that you have to now normalize the sum of squares by how many measurements I have. Okay? If I'm going to be doing a comparison, then I need to keep track of that. Because ultimately, what I'm going to be asking myself is, how much did I not fit versus how crappy is my data? But it'd be unfair if I don't keep track of how many estimates I have here. And so I need to now calculate another quantity. And this is the next quantity. And that quantity is a mean square. OK? And so the mean square is, well, you divide this one by this one. OK? So we have the, uh, you know, it's basically you normalize that, and it's the, the number here, and you just do that in the table. It's a very mechanical process here. Uh, the, 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 this one, this one, this one, this one are all just simply divided by the number of degrees of freedom. OK? Now you're almost done the analysis of variance table, because now when you get to an actual mean square, this is what a variance is. Okay. In a sense, it's a normalized variance. And I'm at the point now where I can look at it and say, I want to now compare. In a sense here, I want to compare um, my, um, my, my, ability, my, mo my, my model fit. In other words, how good does the model fit as compared to the, in this particular case, it is here. How, uh, how much um, left out terms are there? Okay, and I want to ask whether or not these are statistically significant or not. And uh, the, the, this is referred to as the F calculated value. And what an F calculated value is, is it's a ratio of variances. And so literally I take this number here, this variance, and I divide it by well, I want to I look at how good my model fit over how crappy my data is. 
And so I go down to here and I look at my variance. This is essentially, this down here is my mean square for my true error. And I put that on the bottom. And that's what an F-calculated value was. It's a ratio of how good my model was at fitting the data relative to how crappy my data was. And then the other one then is this right here, is same deal. It's uh, a measure of the degrees of freedom here, that is, here's my left out term variance relative to how crappy my data is. So you take that number as well, that goes on the bottom, this number goes over here. And so what I've measured now is these ratios that give me an idea of how good is my model relative to crappiness of data, how much did I not describe of the data relative to how crappy my data is. Okay? And so what I'm basically asking, if you want to think of it graphically, okay, would be like this. Let's say that I think that there is curvature here. I feel like I ought to put a curve through that. I could put a straight line through that. Okay? And if I put a straight line through that, then I have, I, I, I'm asking then, can, am I, is this, very, this uh, deviation, the model obviously a little high here, a little low there, is that deviation from a better fit statistically significant? That's what the left out term analysis is about. Okay? Now all you do at this point is you go to the tables, just like we did in the, in the last class, and you look up a F table value. And an F table value is actually looked up by having to know the ratio of the degrees of freedom. So it's the ratio of the degrees of freedom to the model to the crappiness. Okay? In this particular case, it would be this cell uh, right here and here. Okay? Because uh, the F table has uh, basically two dimensions. And it'll call it V1 and it'll call it V2. And since you're doing the ratio of those two, the table value will come from the degrees of freedom of the mean square of the mean square uh, over the true error, crappy at data. Okay, so it's very important then to have the degrees of freedom here uh, correct. So it's basically the here and there. Okay, the mechanics of this is something you have to go through to really get. So let's then say we'll have this F calculated here. F table here, and now I'm asking a very simple, simple question, is which one is bigger? This is the F table for left out terms. This is the model. Now I always, I told you already back in this particular graph here that the model is always significant. Okay, in, in other words, if your line is anywhere close to the data set, unless you have the world's worst one, it's going to be wrong. And so this is a very easy mnemonic of if this number that you calculate here, it should always be bigger than this value here. And that conclusion is, is the model is significant. Under almost every possible circumstance, that will always be the answer. And so that you now know is, is that if I get down to this one here, and if my F value for my left out terms is larger than the table, that would be bad. That means that my left out terms are significant. If the left out terms are significant, it means that you need to fit an additional adjustable parameter. If it goes the other way, what you want is that, is, is that if my left out terms are less than my value of the table, then it means that my left out terms are not significant. And that means that my model is good enough. And I don't have to you know, add another curvature or anything to that. And so this is what gives you the ability to use an analysis of variance table to ask those questions. The thing that happens in Excel and most other analyses is that they don't do any of this down here and they're always asking a question only about the residual itself. They're not asking a question about left out terms and true error. So you can do this kind of Excel and trend line without having replicated data. But it should tell you it's clearly not possible to tell whether or not a model fits the data set unless the data set has replicated data to know how crappy the data is. You have to have 
multiple observations in order to do an assessment that tells you whether or not you have that. There is a terminology for this, uh, although it's, fine, uh, it's not used a lot, and it's referred to as model discrimination. I'm sure there's probably a, in the nation, probably more politically correct thing, because discrimination, of course, must be bad. Okay. No, but it's actually good. And so it gives you a way of doing that. So literally, the process, in order for you to get good at this, you're going to have to crunch the numbers through and generate your own analysis of variance. You cannot get away with the right-clicking and checking boxes in Excel. Uh, next time, what we'll do in class then after that is we'll actually have you go through this. That's it.